Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford, and I'm back today with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Luke Gordon of the University of New Mexico. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a research subject of great interest to you, in fact, the foundation of your dissertation, which is the etymology of the wine word. Tell us why this is an interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of reasons this is an interesting question. I mean, one of them is it's wine, so people are people tend to be interested in this topic. Um, it's obviously a, you know a very famous, very beloved alcoholic beverage um, that that really has a very rich history. Um, in, in many ways, it has a rich cultural history. It has a rich economic history. Um, and it has a rich linguistic history. These are all things that I've been looking into over the past 10 years or so. Um, I, I wrote my dissertation between 2012 and 2014. Uh, so so this, this is around the 10 year anniversary of when I really started to do this research. Um, and I learned a lot in those first few years and I've still been learning more ever since, uh, even after I finished the dissertation and, and graduated in 2014. Um, so I think it's a topic of great interest to a lot of people, certainly to me. Um, before I started looking into it, I was not really a wine scholar in, in any way. Uh, this sort of grew out of a, a, a graduate paper that I wrote for a particular class that I took in graduate school. At Ohio um, State. At Ohio State, correct. And uh, the paper was just on the linguistic issues. Um, and then the dissertation grew into a 300-page study, uh, as dissertations often do. Um, and that study looked at the origins of wine from uh, multiple angles because uh, as I was doing the research, I became convinced if I wasn't already that it really helps to approach this topic from, from as many angles as you can. You don't want to leave out any data that's out there because when you're dealing with anything that happened, you know, four or five, six, seven thousand years ago, you can't afford to leave out data because you often don't have a ton of data to begin with because so much of it's just been lost um, or, or is difficult to discover. Um, so my dissertation attacks the question of the origin of, origin of wine from, from as many angles as possible. It looks at the, the material evidence, archaeological evidence, um, and, and other things that have been uh, recently developed. Um, you know, uh, analyzing pot sherds in, in laboratories and trying to uh, decide if there was wine in a particular pot sherd using, using chemical analysis, so very modern tools that wouldn't have been available to us even 50 to 100 years ago. Hmm. Um, so we've been able to make a lot of progress, and by we I mean the scholarly community here. Um, we've been able to make a lot of progress on, on, uh, on these topics, um, and, and you can certainly uh, read some books on that. Um, one of the big names in the field on that side of things is, is uh, a scholar named Patrick McGovern, um, who, uh, who has published some really useful books that I cited a lot in my work, um, in, in my dissertation, and in the book manuscript that is in, in the process of being published that's based on my dissertation. Um, so that's one side of things that's really important. Um, another side of things, of course, is the literary evidence. Um, we have literature going back 5,000 plus years at this point. Um, and uh, so the literary evidence can tell us something at least about the origins of wine, when it was in certain places at certain times. It can give us a window into the, the, the beliefs and opinions about people living four or 5,000 years ago, about where wine started and where it spread from and how recently it had come to certain areas. Mm. Um, and then, and then the, the, the third big area that, that I was able to make uh, the most uh, progress in as far as, you know, the scholarly community is concerned is the linguistic evidence. Um, this, is, this has been a, a hot button topic for, for a while now. Um, it's been developing, I would say, for over 100 years, this, this idea. So I'm certainly not the first to look at this, um, but uh, I've been able to hopefully push the boundaries of scholarship forward uh, somewhat and, and sort of advance our understanding of what's going on with the with the linguistic evidence. And so what I specifically mean by the linguistic evidence is this 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 wine word. Um, if you speak a number of, of European languages and you know the word for wine in those languages, you've probably noticed that those words are very similar. So if you know English, Spanish, and Russian, uh, you, you do, these are languages that are all Indo-European, but they're not closely related to each other within the Indo-European family. Um, but but those words for wine are very similar in, in those three languages. And pretty much, you know, pick, pick three European languages and they're probably going to have similar words for wine. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is why? That, that, that's, a, that's a question in search of an answer. There has to be a reason for that. Um, we know linguistically that the, the relationship between the sound of a word and its meaning uh, is, is, is usually arbitrary. 
uh, with with some exceptions, it's usually arbitrary. So if there's if there's a certain word like we know or we know or whatever um, that's similar in a bunch of different languages, it's it, it's probably not random chance. Um, the two best you know possibilities are borrowing and common inheritance. So borrowing, of course, means that one language has the word, and then they give that word to another language, which explains why they, those words look the same. Um, and the, the other explanation, common inheritance, is that the languages descend from a common ancestor, and that that common ancestor had a word that was something like that, and then that word disseminated into its descendants naturally as those, as those languages evolved over time. Um, so, so one of the things, one of the questions that I've been working on for the past 10 years is where did this wine word come from? And, and I'm saying the wine word because in English, that, the word wine is part of this, you know, family of words that, that spreads throughout Europe and, and uh, the Middle East uh, that, that mean the same thing, that's referring to the same thing. So we want to try and understand where that word comes from. And as I understand it, it's actually a cross-linguistic family word, right? Exactly. It's roughly, I mean, you can tell that there's some, somehow the same word underlies the word in Indo-European, mm -hmm. in Uralic. Correct. In, uh, Kartvelian. Yeah, like and Georgian, Semitic. And Semitic. And Semitic. So it starts somewhere. Right. But it's a pretty big question, where? Do you have a, a notion maybe right now of where, where the, which family originally has that word? Right. So like you mentioned, it's in a bunch of families, which means that of the two hypotheses that I just mentioned, it must have been borrowed into all of those except one if it started somewhere, right? Um, so did it start in an ancient Semitic language and then get borrowed into Indo-European right. and Carvelian and Uralic and the other language families that have it? Or did it start in Indo-European and get borrowed into Semitic and, and the other ones? Or did it start in one of the smaller ones like Carvelian? Some people think it started in Georgian, which is a, 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 a very small language spoken south of the Caucasus Mountains in the country of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. Um, and, uh, and that place, that part of the world is, is thought to be the birthplace of wine from the archaeological and material evidence that goes further back than we can push with the literature. Um, so there are some people who think that maybe this was a word that started out there, which would make some sense, um, because those seem to be the people many thousands of years ago who actually invented wine, or at least invented the intentional large-scale continuous production of alcoholic grape juice um, so so yeah then the question is okay great so it could be there it could be somewhere else how do we decide the way we decide is to try to look at the linguistic evidence um, and we look at this word in the different language families um, and one of the things we're looking for is does this word make sense in any of those language families. And there are a couple of different levels on which a word can make sense. It can make sense phonologically, which means do these sounds fit in with the common sounds in that particular language family? Um, with this word, we don't get a lot of traction on the phonological side because W and N are very common sounds in mm. most language families. So there's nothing particularly unusual about the, the phonological look and feel of that word. Um, however, we do get more mileage with the when we're looking at the morphological fit. In other words, is there anything about the shape of the word and, it, and its possible connection to other roots in a particular family that, that makes it seem like it's a better fit in one particular family uh, over another? So, for instance, when we look at uh, the Semitic languages, which include Hebrew, Arabic, um, Arabic is obviously the most widely spoken Semitic language today, um, but the Semitic language family goes back at least 5,000 years, and there are, there are many ancient Semitic languages that are no longer spoken, like Aramaic, and, uh, and I guess Aramaic's a little bit spoken, but it's not a widespread language. There are some that are completely extinct, like ancient Babylonian, Akkadian, Assyrian, um, these languages. So, uh, so we, have, we have records of Semitic languages going back almost 5,000 years, over 4,000 years. Um, and they have that word for wine, like they already have that word very early on in most branches of the Semitic language family. So historically, it wouldn't be unreasonable just based on that to say, wow, they've had it for a long time. Maybe they're the ones who disseminated that word to everybody else. Right. But an important thing to remember if you're new to this way of thinking about languages is just because the word is documented in those languages earlier doesn't mean that that's necessarily the earliest place it was. Correct. Because at, yeah. that, at the same time, Akkadian's being written down something ancestral to English is spoken somewhere, something ancestral to Finnish is spoken somewhere. 
Um, it doesn't look anything like modern day English or Finnish, but those languages are nascently there, right? It, yeah. they're, they're just, no one started writing them yet. Yeah, and this is something that we as linguists uh, often have to remind people that there, there, there is no oldest language. Right. <laughs> there is no youngest language. Uh, all languages are equally old. Um, at least from a certain way of looking at it, because they all have ancestors that go back exactly the same amount of time. Right. Um, so, yeah, Akkadian is a very old Semitic language, and by that we mean it was, it was spoken and written down 4,000 plus years ago. Um, and, is, and is extinct. It's gone. It's not spoken anymore. And its descendants aren't spoken anymore either. Um, but, but, but like you said, there was something that was ancestral to English that was being spoken at the very same time these texts were being written. Right. The difference is nobody wrote it down, so we just don't have it. Course, Even if we can reconstruct it. At that time, it's practically Proto-Indo-European. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely prior to Proto-Germanic, so it's like a dialectal Proto-Indo-European, mm. a, late, a late stage of Indo-European, if we want to call it that. And, and so some questions that kind of tangle archaeology and linguistics here uh, come up because, of course, one of the great controversies within studying the history of the Indo-European language family yeah. is where was Proto-Indo-European spoken? Absolutely, yeah. And that's, that's been probably the single biggest running controversy in the history of European studies. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, the single so. biggest controversy. Yeah. Um, scholars over the past 150 years have guessed pretty much anywhere from Ireland to India. And, and some places that are even farther afield. <laughs> I was going to say, weirder than that. Yeah, weirder than that. But like the reasonable guesses are pretty much almost anywhere in Eurasia. Uh, and some places in Northern Africa too, just, just to throw that in there. Um, so, yeah, scholars have been guessing that for a long time. Very early on, some scholars thought that it came from India, um, and then uh, that, that, that idea faded pretty quickly, so uh, I don't know that any mainstream scholars believe that Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European was spoken in the Indian subcontinent. Um, even though the Indic languages, including Hindi, are Indo-European, we think that they came there from somewhere else. In other words, they, they, they were not autochthonous. Uh, or native to that particular area. So if, if they came from somewhere else where they come from, if you look at the map of Indo-European languages, at least in the pre-colonial era, you can sort of just average them out and, and meet in the middle somewhere, and it's somewhere around southern Russia, uh, Ukraine, that area. Um, if you just average everything out geographically, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, uh, averaging doesn't. But it, it kind of gives you an idea of where you might be looking if something spread out. If you see an explosion, then you can work back, you know, you can, you can, you can try to figure out where the, where the thing that exploded was by, by looking back to the center. That doesn't always work with languages, so I'm not saying that's exactly how you should do it, but it's a starting point. Right. And of course, the question at hand here then is, did that place have wine? Right. So we want to understand, and again, let's, let's, let's go back to this wine word. So um, talking about the morphological fit. Uh, in other words, does this word look like other roots or words in a particular language family? So if we look at Semitic, the, the Semitic languages have clearly had this word for a long time, but there, there isn't a great morphological fit within the Semitic language family. Hmm. Um, phonologically, the sounds are, are perfectly native to the Semitic languages, but they're perfectly native to most languages, so that doesn't really tell us much. Um, but they, they don't seem to have a fit. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, uh, another way to think about this is if you... If you see a word that, uh, that doesn't seem to fit in with a particular language uh, family, let's say, um, one, one reason is that it might have been borrowed from a language family that it does fit in with. Hmm. So out here in the uh, American West, we have a lot of geographical names that are, that are recognizably not English. Sure. They don't fit in with the English language. They don't mean anything in English. Um, but they might mean something in another language. So for instance, there are a number of towns, we've talked about this, named Tonopah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. throughout the American West. Um, in English, Tonopah does not mean anything. And it doesn't look very English. And it doesn't necessarily look very English either. So there's a phonetic, phonological, and morphological reason to think that maybe Tonopah is not a native English word and that we got it from some other language. So as it turns out, when you when you analyze this, you find out that uh, that what what which particular Native American family is the is Tonopah from? So Pa is water in Shoshonean languages like Shoshone okay. and Comanche. So and from a very a very particular family of Native American languages because they're all very diverse. Um, so from the Shoshone languages, we we find that in in that particular language family, Pa means water, and this is a 
This is a name that shows up in a number of, uh, or rather a morpheme, a little thing that means something that shows up in a lot of place names all over the West. Tonopah, Ivanpah, those are two that come to mind. Is Paiute from that? I was, I don't, I was just thinking that. Yeah, Paiute might mean water ute. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're, we're not Native American language scholars here, but I wouldn't be surprised. Same language family. We'll look this up later. Ute is the same language family. Okay. So it's not so, impossible. So, so Pa means water. I don't know off the head what off the top of my head what tono means. Did you say? I can't remember. Yeah, it's, but it's it, also an uncompagre, which it contains. Oh, the pa and uncompagre. Okay, okay, very yeah. cool, very cool. So we see this thing floating around that means something, and we happen to know that in some in some languages that are native to this part of the world, it means water, which kind of makes sense if you're naming a place after water or good water or bad water or no water or something like that. Um, so that's a good example of of, of seeing a word and trying to figure out where it fits morphologically. If, it's, if, if it has parts that make sense in that language, there's a decent chance it comes from that language, right. especially if they don't make any sense in the other languages. Right. So again, tonopah doesn't mean anything in English, but it means something in some other languages. And so even if we didn't know the history of this area, which we do, so we're kind of cheating, because we, we, we know that English got this word from these languages just because of our historical knowledge. But let's say we had no historical knowledge and we just had that word, we would still guess that that word came from these other languages and not from English. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, I mean, of course, you're more familiar with the Semitic material than I am. Uh, yeah, I need to, somehow I got whipped around. Um, so typically roots in Semitic languages are Triliteral. Of three consonants, right? Yeah. And you don't have that in Y. You do if you count the middle one as a Y. Oh, okay. W-Y-N. Um, and, and the Semitic languages do actually count that as a Y. Oh. They actually right. write it, well, originally W-Y-N. There's some yeah. sound changes that happen. I keep doing this. I keep hitting this chord. You're too expressive with your hands. Yeah, I am. Jackson's the professional here, so, you know, blame well, it on know, me. You... you <laughs> Of course, you remember the thing where they asked me to move my hands more. Um, oh yeah, right. Anyway, there we go. Okay, that looks all right. Um, so does it fit Semitic? Then, it it doesn't seem to fit Semitic. So um, wait, but but if it has the three consonants, well, what is it that doesn't fit? There's no root in Semitic that means anything that would be W Y N. Oh, okay. In other words, to go back to the tonopah thing, like like okay, we have the sounds T N P and H in English, fine. But, but it doesn't mean anything in English. Um, so there's nothing in Semitic that it seems to really fit with. Okay. There have been a few abortive attempts to, to connect it to things in Semitic, but it, I, I don't think it's very convincing. And I don't so, think most people find it very convincing. So it's not part of a productive root. Correct. Right, like the Correct. way that you would see, oh man, I always have a hard time thinking of examples when I need them, but like um, Eshed is waterfall, right? Am I right? I think you're, uh, So yeah. there's probably something else with the same consonants that means something related to water or falling or something, right? Uh -huh. Am I well, in, in Biblical Hebrew, the word for water is mayim, so it's okay. not actually related to that at all. But uh, yeah, but then I there mean, would be other words with M, Y, and M that are related yeah. to water, right? Correct. Yeah. And sometimes it's just me, me, mayim. Mayim looks plural, actually. It's morphologically plural, which huh. just, you know, gets us off into the weeds of Semitic linguistics. But either way, the point is that, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really Right. There's not really a, connect. It's not part of a productive route where you see a lot of related words that have similar consonants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, right. When we look at Carvelian, which again, the, 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 the Georgian language is part of this small family called Carvelian languages. Uh, it doesn't seem to have connections there either. You're going to flip that again. You're, yeah, I am. This you're like a dog going. taking his leash around a table. Right, room. right. Here it is, right here. There it is. Um, and it's very windy too, so it keeps like blowing. It keeps like yeah. blowing at me. I don't know if you're, you're, you're kind of holding your hat there. I can so, give you a hat to hold in front of yours. Oh no, I'm good. So yeah, they don't, they don't tell you at home, but hats have uh, multiple purposes. One of them is to shield the microphone from the wind, so. You want this other one? <laughs> I'm fine, I'll deal with it. It's, I need to get the wireless ones like Ian uses. Yeah. Uh, so we look at Carvelian, it doesn't seem to fit. Um, we look at Etruscan, because Etruscan is another language um, that is, that is uh, at best, you know, dubiously connected to Indo-European, and, and, and the consensus is that it's not Indo-European. Um, doesn't seem to fit Etruscan. Um, it's in Uralic. Uh, I don't think it fits Uralic. It's a pretty obvious borrowing in Uralic. Yeah. Um, 
and and it's it even seems to show up in ancient Egyptian, although that hmm. some people debate that, and it's 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 not a very important word. Um, but regardless, it pretty clearly doesn't fit in ancient Egyptian either. So we 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 knock out the language families one by one, and we're left with Indo-European. Um, now, if we knocked out Indo-European as well, we would probably just throw up our hands and say it's probably from some language that doesn't exist anymore. And this is this was actually this used to be the most common uh, belief among scholars. Uh, 50 to 100 years ago that this was what we call a substrate word which means that when Indo-Europeans invaded the parts of Europe that they currently live especially the Mediterranean um, they didn't have this word but the people who were already living there did right. and they had the, they had wine they had the word whoever these uh, you know anonymous people were the Indo-Europeans invaded them uh, mingled with them slash kicked them out and, but then they took over some of their vocabulary and so this word according to this theory wouldn't be Indo-European, but it wouldn't be Semitic, and it wouldn't be anything we know about because it, it would have belonged to people who are gone, and we're just we, we don't have their languages, and you know we just say, well, it's somebody else's word, and we'll never figure it out. That 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 would be the case if the word didn't fit in Indo-European. Fortunately, again to go back to the tonopa example, it it, it does have a tonopa like uh, appearance within Indo-European. What I mean is that it means something within Indo-European. It's not just a random set of uh, vowels and consonants. It fits comfortably within the phonology and morphology of Indo-European. Um, and not only that, but it's connected to a, a very well-known root in Indo-European, a semantic root, uh, something that, you know, a, a series of sounds that mean something. Um, and that, that root was way, which is usually written W-E-I H1, and this kind of gets into the weeds of Indo-European linguistics, but there was this sound called a laryngeal in it, um, and it was the first laryngeal for those of you who know about the different laryngeals. So this root, way, and I oftentimes just pronounce the laryngeal just to have it there. We don't know exactly how it sounded. Um, this, this sound that was called laryngeal was there at the end, um, and this, this root me meant to uh, twist, uh, or to or to weave. Weave actually it comes from this root. Weave comes from way. The we part comes from the way part. Um, wind also comes from that. Okay. To wind yeah, sure. is to twist. Um, and if you weave something, you're twisting it together. So this this is a, a, a root that is very productive all over the Indo-European languages. Um, and then there's something else in Indo-European that you can add to a root um, that, that is its own morpheme or meaning-bearing unit, and that is an N with perhaps a vowel on one of the sides of the N. And that is a little morpheme that means pertaining to. Um, so there's a whole class of nouns in Indo-European that we call N-stems that are just a root plus an N, and, and they build a whole class of nouns uh, together. So when you take the root way, which means to twist, and then you put an N on it and you make it a noun, it means the twisty thing. That's really all it means. It's pretty simple and, it's, it, and it makes complete sense within the boundaries of Indo-European linguistics. In other words, if you know how Indo-European works, that, 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 that's not controversial. Um, so when you take we and you put an N on it, you get ween which is our wine word. That's the wine word right there. It's already there in Indo-European. Now, the next question that you might be asking, and if not, you should be asking, is what's the connection between twisting and wine, right? Like if I drink wine, do I get twisty? Like I walk around drunk, is that? No, this probably actually goes back to where wine comes from. In other words, the original use of this end stem noun in Indo-European was not for the beverage wine, but it was for the grapevine. Makes sense. Because the grapevine is a twisty plant, right? So if you if you had never seen a grapevine before and you were gonna name it, you might just call it the twisty plant. And that would be a that would be a perfectly normal thing to call it. And compare I keep doing this. The uh, the word for wheel in Indo European. Right, which means the turny thing. Right. It's literally just the turn turn. Right. It's even got reduplication. This is quite this close. is how you make up new words. Yeah. You you, you just see what they're like and then you call them things from your native vocabulary. So the wheel is the turn turny thing. Uh, the grapevine is the twisty thing. Makes sense, right? Um, so it turns out that the word for wine goes back to a, a perfectly reasonable derivation in Indo-European, which leads us to believe linguistically that this was an Indo-European word, especially because it doesn't fit in any other language family. So it's not like there's even a good competitor. It's not like Semitic has a, another derivation that makes sense. It doesn't really. Um, so it's either Indo-European or a substrate that we, we have, don't have any record of. 
But given the fact that we know Indo-European was around at least Eastern Europe, Western Asia, uh, during this time period, it's not unreasonable to believe that the word for wine was an Indo-European word originally. Now let's postulate that it was. Then does that mean that in any given Indo-European branch that has a similar word, that it's the native descendant of that root? This is another sticky question. Yeah, this is another sticky question. Um, so for, for scholars who have believed that, that this is a substrate word, in other words, from a language that is lost and we don't know what it is, it follows that it must be a borrowing into every Indo-European language that has it. Um, on the other hand, if we accept that this was a native Indo-European construction, that opens the door to the possibility that it's a native inheritance in, in the various Indo-European languages. However, that doesn't mean that it has to be, because it's also possible for it to have been a native Indo-European inheritance and to have been lost in some Indo-European groups and then to be reborrowed into those groups from other ones later. So, so stipulating that, that this is a native Indo-European word doesn't prove that, that the word in each Indo-European subgroup is a native inheritance from Proto-Indo-European. Right, and so one of the particularly controversial ones here might be Germanic. Absolutely. Right. So let's talk a little bit about why Germanic is controversial. So when we, when we talk about Indo-European subfamilies like Greek, for instance, um, Greek is, as you probably know, spoken in Greece, which is in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Um, it's not that far from the homeland of wine. Um, it is down in wine producing latitudes and regions. Um, so the, the, the speakers of Greek have known about wine. They've lived in areas with grapevines and, and wine production for, for many thousands of years. So most people wouldn't have a problem, geographically speaking, uh, with the idea that, that the word for wine in Greek was a native inheritance from Indo-European. In other words, they, they would have never forgotten about wine mm -hmm. at any point in their history, most likely. However, when you go to some of these other Indo-European subgroups that are, that are spoken further from the centers of wine production, and the wine trade even, like for instance, Germanic, which as far as we know, has pretty much always been spoken in Northern Europe. Um, the grapevine does not grow in Northern Europe. Um, I don't know if it does at all now, but it didn't prehistorically. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not wine country, right? We don't associate Northern Europe with, with wine country. But that's not dispositive either. It's not. Because as we've pointed out, um, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, these same languages in Northern Europe have a word for lion. Correct. So many scholars, including many who are alive today, this is not at all a settled debate. Many scholars will say Germanic, the Germanic languages cannot have had a word for wine that goes back to Proto-Indo-European because they, they were so far away from the centers of wine production and the wine trade and wine drinking for, for so long. They got cut off from all of that. And even if their linguistic ancestors, the Proto-Indo-Europeans, had, had some kind of word for grapevine or wine, the, the Germanic speakers would have forgotten about it. Um, and then th they would have had to borrow it later. And, and that might be true. I don't think we know. And I think this is something that, that a lot of scholars um, uh, uh, claim they know, <laughs> or they act like they know, or they're just trying to make a case. They're trying to sound like a lawyer. They're trying to argue for something. Um, and, and they, they, they perhaps overplay their hand. Um, th I don't think we know that either way. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to be dogmatic in either direction on this. I wouldn't want to be dogmatic and say that that word definitely descends from Proto-Indo-European into Proto-Germanic. I would not want to be dogmatic. However, I also wouldn't want to be dogmatic and say we definitely know that, that this word must have been borrowed from a, another language, uh, you know, further south, let's say, into the Germanic languages at a later date. I, I don't think the evidence is dispositive in either direction. Um, and I think you can make a case in either direction. I don't think we know. Yeah, because the word, you know, if we just look at English wine and Latin, we know, uh, there's not much that you can say 
that you can do to prove that it, uh, the Latin word is the donor of the English word. Mm -hmm. um, they look this, similar, but they look similar in many places. Yeah, because actually there's not that much change that affects that root. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it is from into your from Proto-European and a direct descendant in Germanic, it would also look the same as it looks yep. in the Germanic languages today. Right. Um, yeah. So linguistically, we can't actually tell. Yeah. One of the really interesting data points here that I just recently noticed when we were talking about this yesterday was that in Finnish, the word well, the the earlier word this is actually an earlier and a later word, and that's in itself kind of interesting. Um, the earlier word is vina, mm -hmm. vina. Now, when Finnish borrows words from Proto-Norse or late Proto-Germanic, about 2,000 years ago, it keeps these grammatical endings. Mm -hmm. So you notice we mm -hmm. have these O stems like kuningas mm -hmm. uh, from king, um, or, or ruhtinas from druhtinas, uh, lord. Um, that A would in fact be the neuter singular nominative ending. Mm -hmm. um, that would agree very well with an exact cognate of Latin winum, which right. is a strong neuter singular, well, strong. It's not a term you use in talking about Latin, but it would be in, in Germanic. Um, so, you know, Finnish suggests that the word is already there in Proto-Germanic because it wouldn't be borrowed from Gothic. If it were borrowed from Gothic, that would already be ween uh, with, without that final vowel. It's not borrowed from Old Norse, again, that later stage of the language would already have lost that final vowel. It's being borrowed pretty early, which also Although, suggests... Uh, just to interrupt, I think when we just looked on Wiktionary, it, it, it claimed that it's borrowed from Proto-Old Norse, the Finnish word. Okay, I mean, where are you drawing the line between like but, late Proto-Norse and early Old Norse? But, but this, would, is, this is part of, part of what we're trying to say here is that a lot of the things that, that you find out there that claim to be true, and it just says it on Wiktionary or somewhere else, might not be scholars or whoever is being cited by somebody on Wiktionary might be making statements that they don't have enough evidence for. Yeah, the thing is we don't know. We don't know. But I would say that, that final vowel in Finnish indicates it's being borrowed from a really early stage of the Germanic language. Yeah. I'm talking like probably BC. Yeah. Like late BC or really super early AD. Yeah. Um, now, does that prove that the word is native Germanic? No, but it proves yeah. that it's not proves, but it gets it, it, it proves that it wasn't suggests, a late borrowing. Yeah, and it strongly suggests that it's there at a time when Germanic speakers were definitely not encountering wine that much. Right. Um, so the linguistic evidence, plus I might add also the archaeological evidence that we have, indicates that the wine trade was making its way into Northern Europe at a pretty early date. Um, the One of the older theses was that the Romans were the ones who brought wine to all of Northern Europe. You know, once they conquered what's now France, you know, and up into parts of what's now Germany. They're the ones who brought wine up there for the first time. I don't actually think that thesis is tenable. As you can see, I'm not saying that I think there's one thing that's definitely true, but I mean, this is how science works. If you know how science works, it's, it's, not, it's not that great at figuring out what's true, but it's pretty good at figuring out what's not true. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you rule out enough things, you start to figure out maybe what's true at that point. So uh, linguistics is a science and it's, it's better at figuring out what's not true than what is true. Um, and I think in this case, we can say with some certainty that it's not true that the Romans are the ones who were the first to introduce wine to Northern Europe. Because archeological evidence shows wine being consumed before extensive- Roman Well Empire. before mm -hmm. the, Ro the Roman Empire um, expanded in that direction. And the linguistic evidence also indicates that wine was up there before the Romans ever got up there speaking Latin and giving a Latin-based word to those peoples. And it's worth noting that intoxicating agents might be traded pretty far. It's a pretty Absolutely. tempting thing to buy and sell, yeah. as it still is today. Yeah. Um, this might be a pretty, you know, too real thing to point out, but most of the fentanyl consumed in the U.S. isn't made in the U.S., as I understand it. Yeah. So yeah. just because people are using it and have a word for it doesn't mean they're making it. No, no one, I think, is arguing Absolutely that. not. Denmark was a site of wine production 2,000 yeah. years ago. Right. Um, but it doesn't rule out that they would have had a word yeah. and that they would have known about it. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, let's let's say that that for some long period of time, there were people in Northern Europe who were totally cut off from the wine trade. Like they had no access to wine. They couldn't talk to anybody who, who could get it for them. Even that doesn't mean they wouldn't have had a word for wine right. because cultures 
all the time have words for things that they don't physically have. Yeah. Right? So my analogy to this was lion. Lion. Which is a borrowed word too, yes, but it's borrowed very early on. Yeah. And then for centuries, Northern Europeans who might even, you know, take nicknames involving the sure. lion, right? You know, sure. and, and in fact, there's quite a few names in, in German and French that incorporate, you know, Leo. Yeah. Leonardo, Leonard, sure. Leonhardt, whatever. Um, sure. They're not seeing lions for hundreds of years, but they're talking, they're talking about, about them. Yeah. And they're telling stories about them. I think that's important, right? So we don't want to forget the power of storytelling. We don't want to forget the power of mythology. Let's say that early Indo-Europeans were exposed to the wine trade. And I mean early Indo-Europeans. Um, back to the homeland question, scholars are increasingly focusing, as we said, on southern Russia and Ukraine, that area right there, north of the Black Sea, over toward north of the Caspian Sea. That seems to be the growing consensus. The step. Yeah, the step, really. Um, so they, we have pretty firm archaeological evidence that those areas were exposed to a wine trade from further south. Uh, across the Caucasus Mountains to the south, which is where the birthplace of wine was. So it's actually not that far away from where we know people were drinking and talking about and trading wine uh, at a very early period, long before the Indo-Europeans would have probably even been there. Um, so there's no, there's no chronological problem to saying that the early Indo-Europeans who were speaking some version of Proto-Indo-European, they, they would have certainly known about the grapevine because the grapevine grows around the, naturally around the Black Sea. And that's probably when they coined the word for grapevine. The twisting thing. The yeah. twisting thing, because they would have seen it, especially on the shores of the Black Sea, and they would have said, what's this? I don't know, it's the twisting thing. And that's where that word would have come from. And then the word for wine was coined off of that later, not necessarily at the same time. So I think this is something that people often miss. The word for grapevine doesn't have to be as old as the word for wine. In fact, it's probably right. not. Probably they saw a grapevine before they ever heard of this beverage called wine um, that, that was a trade commodity that was flowing from the south. So they would have known about grapevines before they started drinking wine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, the linguistic evidence seems to indicate that the word for grapevine is older than the word for wine. I think it's one of the strongest parts of your theory here, actually, because uh, by analogy, isn't the word for oak, uh, the, the pear root, derived from lightning? Like it's, the, it's the struck tree, it's the lightning struck tree. So they are naming plants for uh, properties that are easily sure. observable. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. obviously, you know, grape being a twisty plant looks like a, it's, yeah. if, if I were trying to come up with something. You know, we were looking at the ground just a few minutes ago and uh, we saw a very dark green, unfamiliar low plant growing here in the, in the sand dunes. Yeah. And um, if I had to make up a name for that, you know, to remind you what I was looking at, I might have called it the, oh, I don't know, the, the, the dark green one yeah. or something like that. Yeah, because what like else? You, you what reach else for it? obvious things. Right, um, right. Maybe that's a, a dumb example, but, uh, or, or we've got some sage around us here. You know, if I had never seen sage and I was trying to give you a, uh, uh, I was trying to tell you about a place that was covered with sage. I might mm -hmm. call it, you know, the, the sweet plant or something, the sweet sure. smelling plant. Sure. The good smelling plant. Right. right, and then pretend that hundreds of years later after we, our culture had already named that plant, we come into contact with another culture that gives us a beverage that's intoxicating, we like it and we want to buy it from them, um, but we had never innovated it. And we find out that that's made from something from the oak tree. Right. that we've already named and we already know about oak trees, but we've just never developed a product, this particular product from them before. And then we say, what are we gonna call it? Oh, we're gonna call it the oaky, oaky yeah. drink or something like that, which is all the word wine means. It's the, it's the twisty drink from the twisty plant. Not because the drink is twisty, but it comes from the twisty plant, right? So that seems to have been what happened. And, the, and without getting into too much of the linguistic argument, the, the Indo-Europeans seem to have have been sold wine for the first time, let's say, after they started breaking up. In other words, Proto-Indo-European, the earliest stage, did not have a word for wine. They had a word for grapevine, but not a word for wine. Now this accounts for some differences in morphology between the branches, right? Exactly. So this is, an, this is important to understand why the word for wine looks somewhat different in the different Indo-European subgroups. And it's seldom the root that looks different. It's, 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 it's the what they do with the root yeah. that looks different. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so linguistically, it all works out. Uh, again, I've spent almost 10 years uh, talking about this and, and studying it. I've read literally, I mean, this is what, when you write a dissertation, you have to read everything. 
Um, it's not like an undergraduate paper that we've all had to write where you find five sources and write 10 pages and you're done. You, you have to find everything. You have to read everything that has ever been written on this topic. Um, so that doesn't mean you won't miss something. <laughs> Uh, inevitably you'll miss something and I've I've found some things in the past eight years since you know the dissertation was finished I was like oh man I, I should have found this but now I found it which is great right. um, so I've read pretty much everything I can get my hands on on this um, and and uh, I, I I would stake I would stake a fair amount of money to this being uh, what happened based on both the linguistic and the archaeological evidence and to a lesser extent the literary evidence that we have well and by the way I think some of the interesting literary evidence there is that the word occurs in a literating context in the archaic language of the Poetic Edda. And right. Norse. Right. Now, not that that's so incredibly early in an Indo-European context. We're talking about, you know, late Viking Age. Yeah. But. It was already context. old. It was already well established at that point. And it's a context in a culture in which they were not consuming a lot of wine. Right. And they're not living in wine producing regions, but they know about it. Right. They talk about it. It's in their stories. And in a literary context like Odin, which used to start with a W and doesn't own Old Norse anymore, but a Proto Norse yeah. did, yeah. alliterating with wine and Valhall. Yeah. Earlier Valhallu, right? His hall. Right. Odin drinks wine and Valhall that used to have three literate rating stays. Mm hmm suggests that it's also being associated with very high status, yeah. even sacral contexts like that. Yeah. Which makes sense if it's something that's pretty difficult to acquire. Sure. So so again, I think we can envision that from a from a very early period, quite a bit earlier than some people have credited, people in Northern Europe knew about wine. They were able to acquire wine from the South via a complex trade network. Um, we're, we are often surprised when we discover how extensive trade networks were in antiquity. Um, you know, we're not the only people who have ever had extensive trade networks. Right. Um, we're, we live in a very connected world, but they lived in a pretty connected world too. Um, so people who are living well outside of the range of the grapevine um, and well outside of the range of being able to create your own wine, nonetheless were able to acquire it it would have been very expensive. It would have been a status good. It would have been a luxury good. Um, it would have been something that kings were drinking, which I think is why in a lot of these ancient stories, the gods drink wine. Mm -hmm. because Including a Norse story. Yeah, because what would the gods drink but a really fancy, expensive beverage, right? Right, right. So it's clearly something that's a status symbol. If you were just a random person, you probably wouldn't be able to afford wine or drink it. Um, it was a high-class beverage, partially because of how difficult it was to get. Um, partially because of how far away it came from. But they knew about it, they talked about it. Some of them drank it, at least on special occasions. I think you make a good case, and I'm looking forward to your book. I am too. Uh, the, 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 uh, for those of you who don't know about the, the process of academic publishing, it can be long and, and winding. I guess, which is appropriate for uh, for something that has to do with a root that means to wind. It's its own twisty thing. It really is. It really is. So uh, the manuscript is done. Um, I'm I'm in talks with the publisher, and uh, in in academia, you just never really know how that goes. Uh, but it will get published eventually, and when it gets published, we will talk more about it. And your dissertation is publicly available. The dissertation is publicly available. Absolutely. So now my the book manuscript is an updated version. So basically, what I've done for the book manuscript is uh, there, there's been a lot more research that's been done in the past ten years, which is great. So I've included all that stuff. I've I've changed arguments where appropriate. Fortunately, most of it seems to be agreeing with what I'm saying and not disputing it. So that helps. Um, the the in general the 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 communis opinio, the common opinion in scholarship is is heading toward what I'm arguing for here and not away from it, which is gratifying as a scholar to know that people are starting to agree with you more um, as opposed to, you know, disagreeing with you. I wonder what that's like. I know, right? <laughs> I better enjoy it while it lasts. Um, so, so I've been able to update my book without totally radically changing the thesis because most of the new evidence is in support of it, which is, again, fortunate. Um, you know, I've made it better. I've included stuff that I didn't include. I've updated some of the linguistic arguments um, with some small things that, you know, have occurred to me or that I found in the past eight years. Um, and I've rearranged it. I think it's better written and better arranged now than it was when I wrote it, uh, the, the dissertation eight years ago. However, yeah, if you want to get a preview of it, uh, go check out my dissertation. And I do have a couple of articles 
that have been uh, uh, published in scholarly journals as well that, that you can find. I'll point you to where you can, you can see those folks. Well, thank you so much for your time as always. Yeah, it's great to talk about this stuff. I think it's a fascinating question and a great example of real linguistic detective work that still remains to be done in historical linguistics. Yeah. Well, for now, from beautiful Colorado, we're wishing you all the best. Thank you.